Songs of loudest praise. 
daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prompt to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prompt to If you're one of those people who likes to follow along in their Bible, we're on 2 Kings chapter 2 this morning. And um, this, is, this scripture can be painfully annoying because you've got two guys with very similar names and it confuses me to preach it, so I know it's going to confuse you to listen to it. But you've got Elijah and then you have Elijah. And that S and that J is really important, so I may like over-enunciate. So don't make fun of me too much if I'm like Elijah, you know, or Elisha. But Elisha was the one who was plowing in the field. Remember, if you've, if you've studied this story before, and Elijah was the first prophet who came and found him in the field and passed his mantle down to Elisha. You already got it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I'm going to read this, uh, this, this awesome story to you this morning. And I'm going to start at the very first verse. I spent about two hours debating where I should start, and finally I said I should just start at number one. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied. So be quiet. I wonder how he said that. I mean, it could have been, So be quiet. I'm nervous. Or it could have been, so shut up! You know, I know. You know, I don't know. We just don't know. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elisha said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan River. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, What can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. Now, isn't it interesting that a 
Elisha didn't think about what he could get from him as far as his stuff, as far as things, you know, the way we look at, you know, things, the way we, we sometimes treat God like Santa Claus, you know, we want this, we want that. But instead, he says, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want to be like you. I want to have the faith that you have. I don't want what you have. I want who you are. I want that to be me. Verse 10. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. Now do you see what Elijah did there? Elijah challenged him. Elijah said, look, if you're still hanging around when I'm finally taken up to heaven, it's going to be yours. But if you turn back and go the other direction, it's not going to be yours. You have to stay near me if you want this calling. And as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha is saying, How do I continue on without the only spiritual leader that I've only ever known? How do I continue on without my mentor and without my spiritual guide? Some of you are asking this morning, How do I move on without the only love that I've ever had in my life? How do I move on without that loving parent that was always there to support me when I needed help? How do I continue on without the only friends that I've ever known? And it says, Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Rather than give us a demonstration or give him words of how Elisha felt about this. He gives him a demonstration. He tears the cloak in two. In other words, he's saying, my life has been torn into. He's lamenting that this man of God has been taken from him. And there are some things in your life that will rip your heart in two. And you won't even know who you are anymore. And part of you will be here and part of you will be there and you'll feel just like that garment. So in verse 13, Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. The Jordan River represents crossing over. It represents change in Scripture. You cross over the Jordan into what God has for you next. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. And he says, Where now is the Lord, the God of Elisha? He asked. And when he struck the water, it divided into the right and to the left. And he crossed over. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this morning... I pray that this can be the morning that some of us here who need to cross over, who need to cross our own Jordan River and go into the destiny and the future that you've called us to, I pray, God, that this will be the morning that that will happen. Open our hearts, open our minds to what you have to say to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you know this about me, but I've, um, I've done some crazy things in my life. I've done some stupid stuff. And luckily, I do a lot less stupid stuff now than I did when I was younger. And I do a little stupider stuff, less stupid stuff now than I did two years ago. And I kind of try to get better with age. But I still do some pretty stupid stuff. And one of the most recent stupid things that I did was I made the mistake of when I lived in Tennessee of taking my son Solomon to a pet store. And I was walking through the pet store because I'm not a big pet guy. I don't want to get on anybody's, you know, 
I know a lot of y'all love animals, and I love animals too. Animals are great. I support animals. They're wonderful things, except for snakes and spiders and mosquitoes. And animals are great. Dogs especially. Dogs are the cutest little thing. I've been to some of y'all's houses. Um, and anne has got the best one. But I've been to a lot of them where these little dogs will run up to you and they're so cute. And remember Anne, he's like got in my lap and he looked all cute right there. I love dogs and dogs love me. They do. Then there are cats. And cats are the spawn of Satan. I'm pretty sure that if you go to Satan's house, he has 30 cats in there with him. I'm pretty sure. I love looking out at y'all, and some of you are like, yeah, and some of you are like, I'm going to send him an email Monday morning that he is not going to like. <laughs> but yeah, so cats, you know, so I was like, we're going to go into the pet store, and we're going to get this. Um, we had a little dog at the time, so I think we were there to buy some dog food. And so, of course, with a little kid, Solomon was about five at that time, you have to, you know, go around and look at all the animals, right? You got to look at the little fish, and you got to look at the turtles, and the, and the evil cats, and the little dogs that are cute in the cage. And so suddenly we come across this cage where the birds were, and there were some parakeets. And Solomon grabbed me, and he pulled me over there, and he said, Daddy, look at those birds. They're so cute. They're adorable. Look at them. Can I have one? Can I please, please, please? And he did this dance. And remember that Sunday where I was, where I told you the song that he sings sometimes when he feels like, you know, he's, and he thinks he's being real sneaky. And he's like, I have an awesome daddy. I have an awesome daddy. And then finally, just when I'm singing along with him, because I'm like, yeah, you do have an awesome daddy. He's like, because he's going to buy me a bird. And he, and he did that on me. And I'm like, okay, son, we're not getting a bird. We got a little dog. Dogs are cute. We don't need a bird. He's like, and then he starts turning into Dylan and he starts speaking logic to me. He's like, look, it sits in a cage. You don't have to let it out. You don't have to walk it. You don't have to do anything. You just put some food in once every two weeks. Maybe some water, you know, if you're feeling nice. And the bird takes care of himself. It'll be great. And he knows, Solomon knows that I like to talk to myself. I don't really refer to it as talking to myself. I refer to it as thinking out loud. And so he's like, Dad, you can talk to yourself and people would just think that you're talking to the bird. It'll be perfectly fine. And, and the bird is a good listener. And it just, he was coming at me. So finally, I'm like, fine. But if we buy one bird, we got to buy two. Because they just, they're supposed to come in twos. I read the story of Noah and, and all that. So I'm like, two birds. They got to have friends. They can't be lonely. And so, so I got two birds. I got the cage and all this toys and stuff to put in there and we go home and we set it up and I'm like all right we got birds now until they got comfortable and they got loud I had no idea birds got loud they were like tweet tweet at the top of their and I would I would put them in the downstairs room close the door and I could still hear them all over the all over the house and I would try to go to bed at night and I couldn't sleep because these stupid birds wouldn't shut the heck up. And I finally, a month after having them, <laughs> I, we, put a, we put a little ad out on Craigslist or somewhere like that. And this cute little family came and we said, look, if you will take these birds, you can have the cage, you can have this food. You don't owe us a dollar. Just get them out of the house. And uh, we told Solomon they were going to a better place with a family that could play with them more. And he loved it. He's like, well, that's cool. We're like a halfway house. You know, they come here and we get them ready for the next people. It was good. But here's the thing. I feel like I kind of like, I liked the idea. I liked the concept of having birds. But I didn't really like the reality of having birds. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we can like the concept of having something but we really don't like the reality. Like, for example, some of us like the concept of being married. But we don't like what that calling is really going to bring into our life when our husbands or our wives are driving us crazy and we have to, you know, love them the way that Christ loves the church. Some of us like the concept of being a dad. But we don't like the practice of being a dad. Some of us like the concept of a growing church. But sometimes we don't like the reality of a growing church. 
Some of us like the concept of evangelism. But we don't like the reality of evangelism. Some of us are like all of us. If I, if I talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, if I visit all of your houses after today and I said, hey, what do you think? Do you think the church should grow? Every single one of you are going to be like, yep, we're going to grow. We're supposed to. Let's do this. Let's do this. But then in the back of our minds, we have these little things that are like, well, yeah, I like the concept of a growing church, but only if the people look like me, only if they're about the same age as me, only if they like the same kind of music as me, only if they come from this type of theological background, only if they dress a certain way. Yeah, yeah, I want to grow, but it's got to be from that 125 people out there that are just like that. <laughs> you see, we like the concept of outreach, but we don't know if we really like the reality of what that outreach produces. One time I was in a church, <laughs> and I can't believe this person said that, but this person was like, you know, Tim, I really love that the church is growing right now. I mean, this is awesome that we're attracting new people and everything, but have you noticed that there is a couple of them that aren't living a holy life? And, and I wanted to say, of course! What are we here for? Do we expect the people that we reach in outreach to come in as perfect Christians that can quote books of the Bible back to us and have these perfect lives? Of course not! That's ridiculous! They would already be going to church somewhere. You know? That's absurd. And of course what I wanted to do is I wanted to take this person and I wanted to put a hidden mic on him and a hidden camera and follow him around for just 24 hours. Because I guarantee you 24 hours is all that it would take for me to discover that this person isn't quite as holy as, as they think they are. But a lot of us like the concept of a growing church, but we don't like the calling. A lot of us like the concept of being called by God. We love the idea of God calling us to do something specific and important. But we're not sure that we really want to pay the cost that that calling is going to come with. How many of you, just by a show of hands, would love to be called by God to do something important? Any of you? I would love to be called by God to do something. I feel like I am called by God to do something. And I would love to have a church filled with a hundred people that all feel like they were called by God to do something important. And that's why I wanted to look at this scripture a little bit this morning because I feel like this scripture shows us a little bit about what it's like to be called by God. And I want to back up and I want to show you this because it's really interesting. Now this is after six years of Elisha following Elijah around. Okay, Elisha is called by God to be the next prophet after Elijah. And he follows Elisha around for six years. And after devoting six years of his life to this, right before Elisha is about to receive his calling, listen to what happens. In verse 2, Elijah says, Please stay here. Did you catch that? Now, did you also catch the part of Scripture where Elisha says, look, if you want this calling, you're going to have to stay close to me and you're going to have to be there when it's time for you to fulfill it. When God finally says it's your time, you need to be right here with me, right? But then he says, stay here. I'm going to Bethel. You stay here. And then a couple verses later, Verse 4, he says it again. He says, Elisha, please stay here. Elisha, do you really want this calling? Because I know you like the idea of being a prophet. I, I know you think this is a cool gig. It really beats plowing in the fields. I know you like this. But it's not as easy as I'm making it out to be. It's really hard. A lot of us get killed. 
A lot of times we have to say something and the people don't want to hear it and we get stoned. We don't have many friends. Now look at verse 6. Please stay here. He does it again. Elisha tries to get Elisha to abandon his calling three different times. Elisha, do you really want this? And the interesting thing about this is it's not the devil that's trying to get him to turn back. You know, we always like to blame everything on the devil. The devil was tempting us to go this other direction. It was the man of God that was giving him the off-ramp. It was the current prophet of God who was saying, do you really want this? You know what? I'm going to Jericho. You stay here. I believe that God, as we get closer to what our calling is, will give us off-ramps. The closer we get as we drive down this road to our destiny, the more frequent these off-ramps will be where God will say, look, what I'm about to ask you to do is going to be tough. It's going to cost you something. I'm going to want you to chase after me and do something big. Are you sure you want to do this? Because here's an off-ramp. And here's an off-ramp. But if you're with me, Keep coming forward. So Elijah gives him three more chances to turn back. And Elisha says, no, not a chance. I haven't followed you around for six years just to turn back now. I didn't leave plowing those fields and leave my oxen just to turn back now. And by the way, that plowing in the field prepared Elisha for what was coming next. How you're working with what you have now is going to determine what God will give you in the future. So in this season of your life, the temptation is going to be for you to chase after what you think God's going to do next and neglect what God's doing now. But if you neglect what God's doing now, even if you get to what's next, you won't have what you need because you need what God's doing now. Elijah found Elijah in the field. He found him sweating. He found him plowing. He found him working. He didn't find Elisha in prophet school and say, hey, I want the top of the class to come with me because they're going to be the next prophet. No, he was being prepared in the field. That's where God found him. And I want to show you how this happened because we didn't read that part of Scripture. This right here is not just a blanket. This is the cloak of calling. And I need one volunteer one very brave volunteer. Okay, Jimmy, come on. <laughs> Jimmy didn't volunteer, but we take, we, take, we take recommendations. You know, it's like, it's like a radio station. We'll take recommendations at Westminster. All right. This is how Elisha did it. You are going to be Elisha, the person plowing the field. And I am going to be Elijah, the man of God. That makes sense. I'm the man of God. You're the person plowing the field. Well, I got to do all the work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you're plowing. Start plowing the field. Okay. Come on. Which way? Either way. Okay. You just start plowing. There you go. Okay. So Elijah walks by. Keep plowing. <laughs> and walks off just like that. Isn't that funny? I think it's funny, but I, th I look at the Bible a different kind of way. I, th I think the Bible is funny. Oh, no, 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 stay. we got to do this again because they need to get this part because this is very important for the rest of the message, okay? Now, I want you to notice there's no resume. There's no career fair. There's no conversation. There's no second interview. There's nothing like that. Elijah just walks by, hits him with a cloak, and walks off. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it.
<laughs> Do you see how crazy that was? That was crazy. Listen, if you're one of those types of people who like to write things down, write this down. Purpose doesn't have a parking place. Purpose doesn't have a parking place. It keeps moving. It always passes by. Purpose doesn't come up to your door, to your front porch and ring the doorbell and stand outside and say, hey, whenever you're ready, I'll be here. No, purpose walks by with the cloak of calling and throws it at you wanting to see if you will catch it and chase after it. Or won't you? So will you chase it or won't you? You see, the thing is, all of us know a couple of people that we feel like have been called by God, who have a higher calling from God. We all know someone where we feel like, this person is so lucky. I don't know what they did, but God has chosen them to do this great thing, and He never chooses me for anything. And we say that about this person. But here's the thing. You have no idea how much that calling has cost them or how many years they've had to chase after it just to get to where they are today. A calling does not come easy. A calling is hard. And some of us like the idea of those little birdies in the window but we don't like everything that's going to come with it. And another thing is you have to be close to God to receive the calling. Did you notice in the story that there were 50 other prophets standing at a distance? They were there to see what was going to happen, but they weren't close enough to Elijah to receive the mantle, to receive the next calling. You have to be close so let me ask you, how many of you today, don't raise your hand or anything, but look into your own heart. If God was to call you to something this morning, would you be close enough to hear Him? Are you truly sitting here in worship knowing that the God of the universe could speak to you and could call you? Or are you here to think about what you want to have for lunch after the service is over. A good calling is for people who are close enough to catch it. And the funny thing is, if you read this story, and we don't have time to go into the whole story, but if you look back, did you know that after Elisha receives this great calling, I mean, after he's chosen, he has to give the cloak back to Elijah. He has to give it back to him right away. Why couldn't he just keep it? Why was something like that given to him and then he has to follow the other prophet around for six years before he can fulfill his calling? I'm a great example of this. What would have happened if God had given Elisha the ability to perform miracles before he was mature? He would have imploded. I was called by God when I was 19 years old. But if God had let me know right then that I have a gift to preach a little and that this is what He really wanted me to do, I can tell you right now, I would have imploded. Definitely. We all know those people who come to church and they give their lives to Christ. And for the next three months, they are all into it. I mean, they want to be into everything. But then just a couple weeks after that, they've disappeared. God has to prepare us and to make sure that this is something that we really want to do. Because a calling is important. This is real stuff that makes a difference on an eternal scale. So, the, so, so the, the horses come and they take Elijah away and Elijah has to reach down and take his cloak and move on. 
And I see three concepts at play here that I want to mention very quickly. And the first is the concept of never again. The text says that Elisha saw Elijah never again. Everyone say never again. Never again. Never again again is something that God takes out of your life that you never get to see again. It could be um, a person. It could be a role that you could play. It, It could be the age of your kids. All of these things are examples of never again. Never again will I be with my spouse until I'm in heaven. Never again will I be married to this person. They've left. Never again will my kids be living here. They're in another state. Never again. How many of you have had some kind of never again in your life? So when Elisha sees his never again, he takes his garment and he tears it in two to lament and to grieve over what he's never going to see again. He's saying it's okay to grieve. It is okay to mourn what has been taken from you. But then he moves on to number two, which is what's been left behind. If never again is Elijah, that's what he's never going to see again, What's left behind is the cloak of calling. So he picks up the cloak and he goes into number three, which is what's next. And what's next is the Jordan River, crossing over the Jordan. So Elisha says goodbye and mourns his never again. He picks up what's been left behind And he goes forward into what's next. If God has taken something from you that you're never going to see again, look around at what's been left behind. Pick it up and go forward into what's next. Because Elisha had a choice here. There were 50 other prophets and what these 50 other prophets were doing is they were saying, hey, maybe God took Elijah over here. Maybe the chariots took Elijah over here. Let's go look and see if we can find him. And Elisha could have done that too. Elisha could have chased after his never again. But instead, he picks up what's been left behind and he moves forward into what's next. And he's the only one that does it. God sent me here this morning with a tough message for some of you. And I've told you before, I don't like giving tough messages, but sometimes it's my job. God wants some of you to know that you are never going to find your future calling while looking backwards at your never again. You are never going to get to do what God wants you to do in the future while looking backwards at your never again. So Elisha picks up the cloak and he says, This looks familiar. This feels familiar. This is my cloak. This is my calling. You know, I'm at a different stage now, a different situation now, but it still feels familiar. So Elisha rolls up the cloak to part the Jordan River. And I can't prove that Elisha did this, but you can't prove that he didn't. But I think that Elisha stood there with his rolled up cloak And I think he remembered how far God had brought him from plowing those fields. And I think he remembered the sacrifice that he made when he put his oxen to death and he burned his plows. And I think he stood there in the pain of what he would never see again. He picked up what was left behind. And before he went forward into what was next, I think he was swinging the cloak. 
I think he was taking some practice swings because there were a lot of people standing around. It says that there were 50 prophets standing at a distance. Not close enough to catch the cloak, but standing at a distance. So I think that he was taking some practice swings. And I think he said, now that I've grieved over what I'll never see again, I'm ready to pick up what's been left behind. And now that I've followed for six years, and now that I've had plenty of opportunities to quit, and now that I've faced some adversity, I'm ready to pick it up. He picked up the cloak. He picked up where Elijah left off. And God is saying to some of you today, let's pick up where you left off. He says, I know you've messed up. I know you've left me for a little while. But all you need is sitting right in front of you. And if you will just pick it up and wind it up, I'll make a way through the Jordan. Are you feeling this this morning? Because God gave me a vision that there was going to be some people here today who needed to stop looking at what's been taken from them and start looking at what God has them ready to do in the future. I still have a calling. I still have a mission. I still have a purpose. I still have a God. Your purpose is waiting for you to pick it up. Pick it up. Smell it. Get a good feel for it. This is your calling. Do not leave worship here today until you've picked it up. The first time that Elisha got it, he got to wear it. The second time, he had to use it. God will let you wear it for a little while and, and get used to it, but eventually the day is going to come and today may be the day for some of you where He wants you to use it. Will you stand with me? There's no doubt that the Spirit of the Lord is in this place this morning. I can feel it. I can feel it. Some of us need to say goodbye when we're done mourning to our never again. We need to pick up what's been left behind and we need to cross over into what God has for us next. You know, this reminds me of the time where Jesus, where His disciples were sad because He was leaving. <laughs> They were lamenting there never again. Never again would they see Jesus here with them like that. And Jesus said, wait, you don't understand. It's actually better if I leave. Because if I stay, you have me. But if I leave, you get my Holy Spirit. Jesus said something else interesting. He said, if you believe in me, you will do the same works that I do and even greater works. Even greater works. If you will just say goodbye to your never again, pick up what's been left behind, and move forward into the calling that God has for your life. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you that you have chosen us, that we are yours, that you have brought us to this place by the power of your grace that you led us here, that we are forgiven, we are redeemed, we are called. God, as the week goes on, help us to explore that calling at a greater level. Help us to grab a hold of it. Help us to stop listening to what the world says about us and to only listen to what you say about us because we are who you say we are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.